Goulash here, and welcome to another episode of... The Gulag. Now that Scooby-Doo returned to Zombie Island is thankfully behind us, it's time to move on from Scooby-Doo for a bit, and on to talking about another influential family-oriented horror series. That also crossed over with Scooby-Doo once, The Addams Family in their first feature-length movie. The Addams Family was created by the late Charles Addams in the 30s as a series of one-panel cartoons for The New Yorker depicting a creepy family's morbid lifestyle, unaware that they seemed scary to outside observers. But The Addams Family didn't reach mainstream popularity until 1964 with the debut of The Addams Family sitcom on ABC. The Addams Family the show fleshed out the vaguely, pardon the pun, sketched out Adams characters. Before developing the series, Charles Adams hadn't even named any of his characters, and their affiliation with each other was loosely defined. They weren't even known as the Adams family until the show was made. The cartoons were one panel gag strips after all, so they didn't require too much extra thought, but a series of 64 half hour TV episodes does. So the show used the aesthetic and humor of Adams' cartoons as a jumping off point and gave the characters their more fully real personalities as a family of wealthy, good-natured ghouls. The American passing Spaniard, Gomez Adams, is the patriarch of the Adams household, a foolish romantic. You wanna blow the other bridge? Oh, some other time. His wife, Morticia, a vampy woman engaged in witchcraft. Grimm's fairy tales. What a lovely name, Grimm. <laughs> Their daughter, Wednesday Adams, a little girl with a love for strange pets. Who killed the dragon? A knight in shining armor. He killed the dragon. The son Pugsley, a crafty troublemaker. Cool. That's for kids. Lurch, the family's towering monotone butler. Grandmama, an old witch who was Gomez's mother in the TV show. And Uncle Fester, an oddball with a love of pain, who was Morticia's uncle in the TV show. I never went to school and look how I turned out. The TV show also included extra family members not introduced in Adams' cartoons, like Cousin It, a short creature seemingly composed of hair, and Morticia's sister Ophelia, a literal flower child. The Adams Family TV show, known for its iconic theme music accompanied by finger snapping, was reasonably popular when it aired and got an animated spin-off in the early 70s from Hanna-Barbera and a TV movie in 1977, but the Addams Family's ABC show was overshadowed by The Munsters on CBS, a similar horror family sitcom that aired simultaneously and saw greater success. The Addams Family faded further in popularity as the series' airings and syndication dwindled, which proved a challenge when Orion Pictures sought to make a big-budget adaptation of The Addams Family in 1991, aimed at drawing in a new generation with limited familiarity with Charles Adams' creations. I think the only Adams Family media made between the 1977 Halloween special and the 1991 movie was that NES game Fester's Quest, where Uncle Fester becomes fucking Blaster Master. The smash success of Tim Burton's Batman in 1989 and the success of Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy adaptation in the subsequent year sparked a huge interest in Hollywood to adapt comic characters into films, which 30 years later has evolved into a fetishist practice in the film industry. The Addams Family film was initially to be directed by Tim Burton, which was a logical choice given his success with Beetlejuice and Batman and the dark aesthetic associated with him, but Tim Burton instead chose to direct Batman Returns, which he wasn't very enthusiastic about working on, but I'm sure he was very enthusiastic about the bigger paycheck. This wouldn't be the last time Tim Burton was attached to an Addams Family project, though. The 2019 CGI film was originally supposed to be directed by Burton 2. As a stop-motion animated movie. And the Addams Family project that Tim Burton is actually working on is an upcoming Wednesday Addams spin-off show on Netflix. Tim Burton is finally desperate for Addams Family work. Despite the Addams Family movie not being directed by Tim Burton, though, it was written by two Tim Burton collaborators. Larry Wilson, who helped develop the story of Beetlejuice, and Carolyn Thompson, who wrote Edward Scissorhands, Nightmare Before Christmas, and Corpse Bride. Evidently, they tried their best to make this a Tim Burton movie without Tim Burton. For the 1991 film, Orion ultimately went with Barry Sonnenfeld as director, who was previously a cinematographer for the Coen brothers. Adam's Family was his first film as a director, and he went on to direct 
direct the Men in Black trilogy and a lot of bad or mediocre films. Under Sonnenfeld, the Addams Family movie went $5 million over its $25 million budget due to script rewrites during production, which made Orion Pictures very nervous, especially due to their financial issues. They were afraid Addams Family would be another big budget flop, so they sold the movie during production to Paramount Pictures. Sonnenfeld didn't even know the film became a Paramount movie until further into filming. The production was long and difficult. Nobody working on it was too worried about the business side of things. Well, despite these production difficulties, does the 1991 Addams Family movie hold up 30 years later? Mostly. Let's discuss further in my review. The Addams Family is not a Christmas movie, but the movie was released near Christmas. So to slightly tie into that, for the opening, they cleverly remade one of Charles Addams' classic cartoons, where Christmas carolers sing in front of the Addams Mansion and have hot tar dumped on them by the Addamses up above. This is all you really need to establish an Addams Family movie. There's no tedious prequel segment or lengthy explanation of who these characters are. All the necessary info is visually communicated in two shots. The opening also establishes this film's tone. This movie isn't just playing off of nostalgia for the TV series. It goes back to the darker, more subversive humor of the Charles Adams cartoons. The film does owe a lot to what was introduced in the TV show, but it ultimately stays true to the style and tone of the original cartoons, while still taking the characters in a new direction. <laughs> Looking back at the show, it's tame by today's standards, like a goth Leave it to Beaver. The characters are introduced organically through their early morning rituals. The audience steps into the middle of their daily lives. There's a sense of rich history to the gothic mansion they call home. It gives these over-the-top ghoulish characters a dose of reality, makes them relatable while still reveling in poking fun of the many ways that make the family seem other. <laughs> The cast of the film is star-studded. The late Raul Julia plays Gomez with suave charisma as a genuine Latin lover while still being a manic screwball on screen. Best, the old business. Angelica Houston is the standout as Morticia with her understated elegance and perfect deadpan delivery of the film's best punchlines. Don't torture yourself, Gomez. That's my job. Christina Ricci plays Wednesday, who is retconned from being the younger Adam's child into being the older child, and it works. She delivers a mature, icy cold performance beyond her years. Where's your costume? This is my costume. I'm a homicidal maniac. They look just like everyone else. Pugsley Adams was Jimmy Workman's only major role, and it's a thankless job to play Pugsley. Likely one of the least popular Adams Family characters. At this point in time, Bart Simpson was an edgier kid in pop culture, and Pugsley is mainly stuck being the target of Wednesday's torture. He doesn't even say anything until 23 minutes into the movie. Cool! The late Judith Molina plays Grandmama, who in this movie is retconned into being Morticia's mother, like in the cartoons, instead of Gomez's mother, like in the show. This movie has a lot of familial retcons, but, uh, Molina has fun with Grandma when she can, though the character is mostly just in the peripheral. The human spirit, it is a hard thing to kill. Even with a chainsaw? Carl Stroykin plays Lurch, the butler, who is completely mute in the movie. Stroykin is definitely no Ted Cassidy, but he does have some delightful moments as Lurch. Finally, Christopher Hart plays Thing, a character who is significantly overhauled from his previous incarnations. In the show and cartoons, Thing is a full creature in a box, but you only ever see his hand. In the movie, he's been streamlined in the form he's gone by ever since. A disembodied hand realized through visual effects, and it looks seamless, believable. Christopher Hart's performance as just a hand is entertaining, wonderfully expressive, and creatively utilized throughout. Now that the main cast is out of the way, let's talk about the actual story story, which is where things start to fall apart a bit. Tully Alford, played by Dan Hedaya, is the only thing scarier than the Adams family, a lawyer. But the Adamses are Tully's only clients left, and he owes money to a loan shark named Abigail Craven, played by the late Elizabeth Wilson, aided by her son Gordon, played by Christopher Lloyd, her ghoulish muscle. You're cold, mother! Oh. Gordon and I enjoy a very special relationship. But Tully strikes a deal with the mother and son when he realizes that Gordon looks conveniently identical to Fester Adams. Fester. You see, in this film, Fester is retconned from being Morticia's uncle, like in the TV version, into becoming Gomez's brother, which became a permanent change. 
Fester went missing 25 years ago in the Bermuda Triangle after having a falling out with Gomez after the guy wooed conjoined twins that Fester had his eyes on. Craven, disguised as a psychiatrist named Dr. Pindersloss, arranges to place her son Gordon in the Adams family household as the long-lost Fester in an attempt to rob the family of their hidden treasure. Now you're back. Yes, back. Back to share your joys, your sorrows, hey, everything. The story is, you know, unnecessarily convoluted for an Adams Family movie. It feels like the kind of plot you'd find in a soap opera. It's not hard to follow by any means, it's just a little too clunky of a plot and distracts from Christopher Lloyd's performance. Do the honors. I've got a real treat in store. Where is it, you ridiculous imbecile? Gordon is a different characterization of Fester from the Jackie Coogan version, naturally. He's a very ambiguous character who's always nervous, in constant fear of his cover being blown due to the nature of him being an imposter. Two out of three? He's an audience surrogate who's kind of a fish out of water that doesn't quite fit into the Adams Family household, but slowly assimilates with them. Uncle Fester, how do you know so much? I've been around. I pick things up. In the Bermuda Triangle? The film just doesn't offer up enough context of who Fester was before he disappeared, so the contrast with Gordon can be a little more clear. You don't see Christopher Lloyd play a pure Fester for most of the film, one of the most iconic Adams Family characters. You get Christopher Lloyd playing Fester through the lens of playing Gordon, the Lone Shark's son, but at the same time it's really hard to accept from the start that Gordon isn't actually Fester. How many fucking dudes look like Darth Vader unmasked? Of course I tried, I still can't find it. You've gotta get over here. It's just a strange choice all around, like it was something from an earlier draft of this film that one of the screenwriters thought was clever, but it couldn't get reworked when further drafts and writers came along. Christopher Lloyd does get a chance to shine more though, when he and Raul Julia dance the Mamushka, an Adam's ritual attended by all of their friends and family. And it is one of the highlights of the film, and it makes me wish there were more moments like this between Lloyd and Julia, instead of focusing so much attention on a contrived treasure heist slash real estate scheme. The plot, the handling of Gordon Fester, and the lame lawyers slash loan shark villains of the film do bring it down, but it's all really just an excuse to have great actors at the top of their games play around with these fun, iconic characters. Gomez and Morticia steal the show as the ultimate movie couple with perfect chemistry. They just purely love each other, and they absolutely don't care if anyone sees them f***ing each other in the middle of a crowded room. Sold to Morticia Adams for $50,000. Wednesday and Pugsley have great sight gags involving their numerous deadly contraptions, culminating in a literal bloodbath during a school play. The film looks great. The muted, drab color palette evokes the black and white comics and TV show it adapts. The set for the Adams Family household is meticulously constructed. The attention to detail in adapting the source material is incredible. For instance, even Wednesday's bed is recreated from Charles Adams' cartoons, with his drawing of an octopus on her footboard. It's a little detail only a hardcore fan would notice or put in. But that's the thing. This film was made by hardcore fans for hardcore fans. When the Adams Family get kicked out of their home due to a legal loophole, it does feel a bit like tedious padding toward the end, but even this allows for some more charming moments involving their stay at a cheap motel. I'll buy a cup if you buy a box of my delicious Girl Scout cookies. Are they made from real Girl Scouts? Gomez becoming a pathetic layabout after his supposed brother's betrayal, with everyone else being forced to try to provide for the family in his place, including Morticia, who is really good with kids. Hansel pushed the poor defenseless witch into the oven instead, writhing in agony. <laughs> Ultimately, the movie rushes to a speedy conclusion where Morticia arbitrarily gets herself abducted and Gomez comes to her aid. Darling, take care. Dirty pool, old man. Along with the help of Gordon, who decides to just murder his mother and Tully in cold blood with a hurricane book. Like, he killed those people just because. Conveniently though, Gordon is struck by lightning and seven months later it's revealed that he actually was the real Fester the whole time. And Mrs. Craven coincidentally found him in his amnesic state and decided to employ him for 25 years as her muscle by convincing him she was his mother. And they just happened to eventually cross paths with Fester's real family decades later through fate. Pindeschloss really did find Fester tangled in a tuna net 25 years ago with amnesia. It's just a f***ing 
stupid twist that still manages to feel ambiguous. And that ambiguity is probably because the film was originally scripted to have Fester likely still be an imposter in the end. Like Principal Skinner. I'm an imposter. That man is the real Seymour Skinner. But the cast hated the idea, and I guess it was one of the many things they had to quickly change in rewrites with some inconsistencies still left. Like Fester genetically being a hairless man, while Gordon has hair, he needs to shave to keep up his facade. Forget that, though. What matters is that Tully's wife is now f***ing cousin it. I almost didn't recognize you. Isn't he handsome? If you've ever wondered who would want a f cousin it, this movie's got you covered. You f weirdo. The film ultimately wraps up with a sequel hook setting up a future Adams child, and this is also another remake of a Charles Adams strip. Also, the credits have a catchy MC Hammer song. The 1991 Adams Family movie is a delightfully entertaining and charming film brimming with comic invention, brilliant performances, and clever nods to the original cartoons. The movie just has a clunky plot, a mishandling of Fester, and lame villains, but these things get fixed in the sequel, which I'll be covering next time. All in all, I give the Addams Family movie four Lumpy Addamses out of five. Look at him. All grown up. This video is made possible through the pledges of Dr. Wolfila's Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to Doc's shout-out tier. All the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my master's dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more videos. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Instagram and Twitter at the Gulag. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my master Dr. Wolfila's Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfila. Also, check out official goulash t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfila. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. You f***ing weirdos.